Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, I have to say happy not 2020 anymore, and welcome to our first webinar of 2021. Uh, my name's Erin. I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction here, and I'll be hosting the webinar. Uh, so for those of you here in the live version of today's webinar, you know, please do uh, ask questions, engage with us throughout the webinar. I will address those questions at the end. And just for quick ref reference, all the questions that you ask, uh, we do keep your identity uh, confidential. So we'll just repeat your question and tackle it live. For those of you in the future watching this off of our YouTube channel, we do monitor questions in the comments section below. So please ask away. And with that, let's get into today's webinar, which is Resource Road Planning and Design, which is combining LIDAR and Traverse data. Now this, I should say, is a bit of a disclaimer. Um, it does apply to other greenfield uh, civil projects, whether that be in mining, um, et cetera. So yeah, a lot of application uh, outside of forestry and resource roads. Okay. In terms of content, uh, we're going to be looking at a basic workflow here for, for working with these two different data sources. So we'll start with some LIDAR and then the additional uh, P-Line survey, whether that's a, a GPS or a more traditionally surveyed uh, Compass and Clino P-Line. So in terms of our first step, uh, with using the LIDAR, we're going to determine the proposed road alignment in the office. We create a 3D surface uh, using that LiDAR data. We can overlay additional imagery, road boundaries, or other map data that we might have. And we can, using that LiDAR uh, and that additional materials, we can choose our preliminary alignment. Um, we also recommend using something called road pegging. You can do that in the location module. It's a great tool for helping you choose the road, uh, that prelim alignment. We won't be covering that today, but we've got lots of videos up on our YouTube channel covering it. So once we've got that proposed road alignment in the office, out in the field, you're going to ground truth your P-line because um, working off of LiDAR by itself is often not enough and not sufficient. Uh, so you'll want to ground truth it. And there you're going to collect some additional survey data, as I said, whether that's GPS or a more traditional compass and clino type survey, uh, record ground features, additional notes for construction. We're then going to geo-reference that survey to our 3D surface. And then in our final step, we're going to complete the road design. Uh, here we're going to create a location design that refers to that 3D surface as well as that P-line traverse. Uh, design the road itself, and then we can generate uh, geo-referenced outputs with all this data, whether that's multi-plot, uh, going out to land XML, uh, with slope stakes, etc., or even to a, a geo-referenced Avenza maps. So, so there's the last part there on staking notes um, as well. Uh, we just want to give a quick thank you. Uh, data, you know, great quality data doesn't, uh, you know, isn't something we typically get from customers and, and are able to share it publicly. So we just wanted to say thank you for the companies that gave us some permission to work with today's data, uh, on-site, landmark, and canoe forest products for graciously supplying, uh, yeah, an example for today's data. Um, two webinars of note uh, coming up that I just wanted to do a little bit of a public service announcement for before I pass it over to Dave, who is going to be handling uh, the lion's share of the lifting in the webinar today. First, we have uh, an upcoming webinar on rural roads and civil projects. Uh, we're actually going to be covering three different examples in that webinar, uh, a new road, uh, so a greenfield road project, a road widening, as well as a culvert and site design, tackling all of those after the topo data has been imported and the model created. Uh, so that's coming up on Thursday, January the 28th. As well, uh, a little bit of a deviation from our usual webinars, we're going to be co-presenting uh, how to work with the True Pulse laser for field traverses. And that's going to be co-presented with Laser Tech, uh, and that'll be on Thursday. February 11th. Uh, registration for both of these uh, is available up at softtree.com slash webinars. And with that, uh, Dave, I'm passing it over to you. Thanks very much, Erin. And hopefully we get the right screen up. Totally good with your screen. <laughs> Thank you, Erin. Okay, so let's start by um, building a 3D model. Um, where are we going to build this model? Well, we want to bring in some data that is um, in our area of interest. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to open a couple of shapefiles. 
Now, um, shapefiles are a nice format from uh, ArcInfo because they are georeferenced. So they have a PRJ file associated with them, which tells you what projection you're in. So here's a shapefile with uh, some roads in it. And I'm going to bring in one more, add it to my map. It's just a rectangle. It's what I call the area of interest, AOI. Okay, and then I, like I say, the nice thing about shapefiles is that they come with a projection. So if we wanted to uh, figure out where this is in the real world, we've got those coordinates. And you could use this feature here, Live Map, to generate um, an air photo background by retrieving from uh, public sources like Bing or Google. So, um, yeah, let's just do that. It doesn't take too long. Um, I'm just going to pick my area of interest here and save. I'm going to go to the highest resolution possible. This is probably the biggest drawback of the public data. It's not high res. Um, and of course, if you have images from another source that are higher resolution, as long as they are georeferenced, Rodent can read them. So you can create a, a background file from an, from any source. You don't have to use our live maps. Uh, great thing about live maps is it's free. And we're almost finished here. It's just going to, to save. Now I've already created um, an image file, so I'm not going to worry about this one. I'll I'll just put it in my uh, my GMAPS folder. We'll come back to the one I I saved later. Um, Good idea to go to full resolution when you do this part and apply transformation and there it is. Okay. Now, um, so that gives me some, some um, information about where I want to put my road, some context. Now I need some 3D data. So let's, let's insert a bunch of LiDAR data, 3D LiDAR data. So I'm going to use the insert file again. And this time I am going to dig for my data. It's in this folder here. And these are LAS files. We can read all kinds of different formats for 3D data. LAS is very common. Another one, um, is USGS DEM, which comes in all different extensions. Uh, and that one's really compact and it's a gridded format. Um, you can also get LiDAR data in ASCII, though that's kind of rare. Um, so lots of ways to get our, our 3D data in. If I click on this button here, it looks at those files and tells me how many points there are in what categories. So you'll notice that it says here there's 66 million points. That's pretty large. Uh, I would not recommend reading more than 10 million points into RoadEng. So if I were to read this and there were um, already, oh, where did that go? There we go. Sorry, it jumped behind for some reason. Um, if there were 66 million points in the ground data, I couldn't read it all in at once. And I would want to use my selection tool to, to limit the number of points. It turns out, however, that most of those points are in, in the unclassified category. And all we want are the ground points. So in fact, there's 2.9 million easily uh, managed by RoadEng. I could just read it in right now to click on OK. But what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to use this um, selection tool to add a polygon um, my AOI feature that I read in, that's the rectangle. Um, so the, the fact that I am importing my LiDAR while I've already got these features in my terrain makes it possible to do this filtering. So what does that allow me to do? I can read data inside the polygon and skip all data outside the polygon. And that will reduce in general the, the amount of data that I have to read. Um, Smaller is faster.
So there's four files. We're, we're just on the third one. There's the fourth one. There's the data. You can hit the escape key and break out of that paint. We don't need to see it. Um, typical LiDAR data, you can actually see in this little section that's, that's visible here that the data is quite dense over the roads. That's where there's no foliage, no tree coverage, um, and less dense outside. Um, let's make a surface. We need to make a, a 3D model here. So I'm going to just build a terrain model. Uh, this is pretty typical stuff, but one thing you might want to do when you're looking at LiDAR data is put in a maximum triangle side. That will show you any holes in the data. Now, it turns out there aren't any holes in this data, so I'm, I'm you know, it's not going to show me anything um, untoward. But if there were gaps bigger than 10 meters in my data, I would see these holes. Okay, contours are optional, but I'm going to make contours. Turn off my labeling. I don't need labels for now. Uh, good. Well, this calculates, Dave, just a great opportunity to remind our participants, uh, especially those of you that joined since the intro, uh, you're welcome to ask questions, engage with us throughout this presentation, enter those questions in the Q&A section of your panel, and you remain anonymous. There it is. There's the, the surface. Okay, let's look at that in 3D. Now, um, sometimes images are not well lined up with the actual 3D data. And you can get mixed up about georeferencing if your image is not perfect. So I'm just going to show the 3D data in the um, 3D window. I clicked on the little cube down here. Um, takes a couple of seconds to put all those points, 3 million of them, inside our, our 3D um, window. There it is. Oh, there are some holes in the data. Look at that. Um, I guess I didn't pay attention when I was going through this before, but you can see, I'm just going to zoom in a little bit here, that there's actually a, a couple of holes in my model um, in these areas here where the, where the data is larger than, well, the holes in the data, the, the gaps between the points is bigger than 10 meters. So that, that gives me... Um, a quick kind of minimum um, resolution that I've got. Yeah, yeah, in this area, my points are quite far apart. The foliage must have been dense. Um, on the road, I got lots of points, and you can see the road cl quite clearly. And uh, that's what I'm going to use to confirm that my image is georeferenced. This is a very good tool for looking at 3D. Turn on track mouse. So when the 3D options have track mouse set, then when I move in the 3D window, I see a cursor moving in my plan window. And similarly, when I move in the plan window, I see a cursor moving in the 3D window. And I'm just going to zoom in on this area down here where the road is. My um, Shapefile road is lying right on top of the image, so those are lined up. And if I look at this in the 3D model, okay, I'm just looking for the, the uh, cursor. There we go. You can see that when my cursor is moving over the road feature in the 3D, it's also moving over the road feature in the plan window. And I, this is good. I've got a georeferenced image um, and my GPS, uh, pardon me, my um, shapefile that came from uh, my GIS database is also lying on top of my 3D data. So I've got a, a good image. Now that that implies, uh, that's, that's step number one. Um, if you remember back to the, um, Oh, here, just look at my notes. Oh, why is that not displaying? Uh, um, 
forget it. I'll tell you what my notes are. Determine proposed road alignment in office. Okay, well, what, that's, that's the next step here. What we need to do now is um, looking at all this data, decide where we want to put our road. And it turns out we want to put it more or less here. Um, I'm not going to go through that process, but the best way to design a, a road location is using our location module. So I would, if I were to do some road pegging, I would open the location module, create a new road, use this terrain, or one without holes, um, to start designing the road without even stepping, setting foot in the field, I would lay out a preliminary road alignment. Now, once I have that preliminary road alignment, I will go out to the field and follow it using uh, various techniques, probably GPS, um, and ground truth. So I can't do that on the, <laughs> on the webinar. Um, so imagine that our surveyor has been out in the field. He's walked along what he thinks is going to be the, the new road, and he's picked up a bunch of information. Um, so what does that information look like? Well, we got two choices. Let's go to um, the survey map module. Historically, road inch started by um, requiring that you create a thing called a survey with side shots using um, basic survey instruments. And here's an example of one. And it looks like I've been playing around with version 10 on that file. And so this is a, a survey with side shots. We've got azimuth, distance, slope, and then side shots. Double click here. You can see we've got um, measured cross sections. Um, like I say, back in, back in the day, this was the way you represented the original ground. Uh, then we add, added terrain modeling, and now we've got LIDAR. So side shots are kind of redundant. We don't need those. Uh, but the other information that we can record here could be fairly valuable. So let's open another file. And just, again, go into my webinar folder here. So this is the surveyed um, preliminary road. Uh, looks like this. I could put my air photo in the background there or any of my other files if I wanted to. Um, let's do... How about just my shape files? Okay. So there's my area of interest. Here's the survey. And uh, in this survey, I did not take side shots. So there's, there's no measurement of the cross sections. Not necessary, because I, I get that data from LIDAR. There is, however, other information, comments, um, culvert locations, ground types, um, other information that could be captured in the field, which is not available in, in the LIDAR data. So for example, I think there should be a culvert here because there's a creek crossing over the uh, proposed alignment. You can't see that in LIDAR. Um, you can kind of guess where the creeks will be, but the ground truthing is the proof. Okay, so this is my P-line survey. Now I'm going to create a road design. So I've, I've done, oh, georeferencing. Let's, let's create the road design without doing any further georeferencing. Um, and I'll show you one of the issues that comes up all the time. First of all, this is georeferenced in plan. What we've got here is a absolute coordinate at the first station of the road, of the traverse. And that was probably entered from a, um, a GPS coordinate. Maybe you sit there for a minute or two and get a good GPS point. There's another one halfway along. That's what this asterisk means. And there's a third one right at the end. So this traverse, which was created with um, low-level survey instruments, compass, clino, chain, um, 
was tied down using georeference points in three places so that it's on the map correctly. And you can see it's branching from the existing road where it should be branching. Okay, so um, let's create a location design from that. Go into our location module. Now we're going into the third and final step of the workflow, which is build the road or design the road um, using the information that we have. So what information do we have? First of all, when I create a new location design, I need a surface. And here's the um, surface that I created a minute ago with the LiDAR data, minus holes, no holes in this one. I must have set the uh, triangle length a little longer. And um, here's the P-line traverse that I just created by uh, surveying the area. So the, the terrain gives me my original ground. The P-line gives me two things. One, um, data that the surveyor picked up in the field, and two, the alignment. So this is something I can usually ignore. It often happens with LIDAR. Um, section points exceeded. If I take a look at my cross section, you'll see that it's a little narrower than usual, but it's way wider than it needs to be. Um, so you can see we've got lots of width in the cross section here, um, but it is a little bit narrower than, at least somewhere, than the, the usual 500 meters. Okay, um, first of all, I notice my first cross section is way underground. What the heck's going on there? Uh, and if I if I were to display some some labels in my profile window, uh, for example. Uh, something coming from the survey, like, for instance, the comments at P-Line. They all appear down here. So what, what we've got here is a survey that was georeferenced in plan, but we didn't get the elevation right. And I wanted to show you this because it happens all the time, and I want to show you the fix. The fix is simple. We just need to do the vertical georeference. So let's go back to our topo. I'm just going to open the one that I created a little earlier. So here it is, well-defined elevations. And to fix my survey, what I do is I import it. And it's this one. There it is. And you can see that the elevations are not right. Like for example here, the elevation of my survey is 1025. But if I just hover my mouse there, it's 1034. Okay, so the the survey is a little off. Happens all the time. GPS is not great at picking elevations. So let's get the elevations from the LIDAR itself. And the easiest way to do that is just to drape this feature. Um, note that if I just turn on draping and apply, I get a whole bunch of extra points. They're called tin points or draped points. This feature now has 2,000 points in it. Um, that's not a big deal. I'm not going to use this feature for anything. But if you want to prevent that from happening, here's a trick. So um, let's just undo that. And the trick is to change the feature to be not connected, then set it to be modeled without elevations. That's the draping setting. Apply. So every point has now picked up the elevation. It's gone to 1035, which is correct. But there's still only 42 points in here. Then go back. Set it to be an elevation feature and connect it and apply. And I've now draped that. Now, some people have um, chosen a workflow where they simply export this back to the survey module. I kind of dislike that because you lose all your original survey information. All you get is the um, azimuth and distance for this feature that's been 
draped in the in the terrain. What you can do, however, which I am going to um, follow up with on this example, is just pull these elevations from here, 1035, and go back to your survey. and type them in. What was it? 1035.4. Okay, that, that does the first the first shot. Um, let's go up to hub 24. Where's hub 24? Well this is the, this is the, a traverse feature so I can just turn on the labels for the comments at survey points, there they are, and there's hub 24 right there, elevation 1016.2, I think you get the idea. So I'm just improving my absolute coordinates, I could conceivably do it for more points, but this is probably good enough, um, or at least Three of them are probably good enough. So let's just do the end one as well. And the end one here is 1008.5. It was pretty close. Now I've made some changes to my traverse. Um, just so I can maybe go back and look at this later, I'm going to do a save as here. Uh, save over top of this one, georeferenced. Right, okay. Um, so let's recreate this alignment and see what it looks like. Actually, I just modified, oh, I'd have to change that. Um, New in version nine, you can you can go into the alignment tabs in your location setup, and you can actually change um, which traverse you're using here. So I could change it here. Um, alternately, I could just go back and restart. I haven't really done anything. But if you weren't aware of that, um, this is this is fairly new in the software. Okay, and now you can. Um, the P-line labels are, are where they should be near near the ground, not on the ground, but near the ground. And now I can start designing my road. Okay. Um, I want to show you another method. So this is using the old school survey with compass and clino out in the field and maybe a GPS um in the field to do some some tie points basically what if we didn't do the survey that way what if we did the survey entirely with a gps unit and this is becoming more common so let's go back to the terrain module and start from scratch here i have some data um, provided by um, our customers and this is a GPS survey so let's go back to the shape files here it is road stations GPS let's see what was put into that file okay so the 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 GPS survey was saved into a shape format. We can read a couple of other formats too, ASCII for sure, um, but shape is a nice one. And there it is, a bunch of points. Now, I'm just gonna select all those points and put some big symbols on them so we can see them. And maybe I'll change the color while I'm at it. Now each of those points obviously has a well-defined uh, coordinate. Um, it also has attributes associated with it. You can display attributes down here. 
If I go into the options for the properties panel um, and display field to add remove, there's all my attributes that came from the um, survey, the GPS survey. So there they are. That little piece of work can be saved in a screen layout. In addition, I kind of want some, some special custom labels. So I'm just going to go and open a screen layout that I created earlier that has both the custom labels and the um, attributes over here. It's called GPS attributes. There we go. And now uh, I can turn on these, these custom labels if I want. Um, so these are points. They're not, they're not features. They're, well, they're, they're one-point features. They're not connected. And it would kind of make sense to connect these all together so that I had a feature. Um, the attributes are attached to the points. And if I connect these together, let's select them all and join. The attributes are still there. So we didn't lose the individual attributes. That's how number four next point is hub number five, so it looks like I'm going in the right direction. Um, that's good. I've got a single feature here, and now I could save this, and here's the trick, I could save this as a traverse file, and then use it to create my location design. Um, problem, it's not draped yet. So let's, let's put this inside the, um, topo file and drape it. So I'm just going to copy this feature, open my topo. I used control C to copy, control V to paste. There it is. And now I'm going to do that draping trip trick. By the way, in version 10, there's a nice function in here, uh, 10 operation. Oh, I'm, is this version 10? Uh, drape selected features. Oh yeah, there's a, there's a new checkbox in here in version 10 that allows you to skip um, 10 points. Okay, um, anyway, we don't want to create a whole bunch of points between these, so I'm going to do this trick of um, turning off connected, then turn on modeled apply. That drapes them. Notice the elevation changed here. And now turn the elevations back on, turn the connected back on, and apply. And I've still only got 42 points in my feature. That's the number of hubs that were surveyed. And I've got a, a nice line representing my alignment. Now I can save as Traverse. Where is it? There it is done this already. I called it GPS stations draped. I'm just going to right over top of this one. So I don't need side shots because the we're going to get them later anyway from the, from the uh, topo, from our LiDAR data. So export. And I've created a, um, a new P-line traverse which required zero, uh, well, <laughs> it still required the surveyor to go out in the field with his GPS, uh, but he didn't have to use a compass and clino. He could use his GPS unit. Probably did multiple readings at each of these points to get accurate uh, coordinates. And, um, oh, one more thing. Before I, before I do that export, and I've already done it, so I'll do it again. Um, can we get those attributes? Let's read that screen layout again. Can we get those attributes to um, go into the survey notes? Well, not most of them. You can do one. And I'm going to choose the hub. So here's the trick. If I want the hub attribute to go out to my survey notes, I'm going to use this feature here, assign. And I'm going to take the hub attribute and put it into the um, feature comment attribute. 
because that gets exported. So here's the hub attribute and this thing works from right to left. So we're taking an attribute, which is the hub attribute, and we're copying it into the comment field. Okay, there it is. And now actually I can confirm that works just by changing the labels to display uh, comments to feature points. There they are, there's all my hubs. Okay, now um, re-export already remembered that I did a tier one last time save over top of it don't need any side shots let's go look at it okay uh, file open that's the one I just created and you can see it's got the the labels in there and the side shots are empty um, I can change the display options so the, the uh, side shots are no longer visible by removing them here. There we go. Now, if I want more attributes in here, well, I've got to type them in. So, for example, I could go back to my terrain here and say, well, you know, there's, there's a, uh, oh, um, I, want, I want this feature to be a good background feature. I don't want it to be part of my terrain, so I'm going to put it into another terrain all by itself. So again, I'll just uh, do I? I don't have another one open, do I? No. So I'm just going to copy it. Control C, copy, create a new terrain. Don't need to save this one. Paste, save as. And I've already got one in here. It's it's called um, GPS Station Straight. So I'll just call this demo. And, uh, oops, wrong format. I want to save it as a terrain. And there's, there's the one I already have. I'm just going to call this one demo. Okay. And get that screen layout with the labels in it, this one. And display the labels so this is this has now got all the all the elevations that I wanted it's got all my uh, attributes for each point oh no it doesn't what's going on here oh I lost my attributes when I did a copy paste hmm. um, tricked myself okay I'll fix that by just opening the file I created a second a uh, uh, couple of hours ago um, let's open this one. So this file was created by importing those GPS points, grabbing this um, screen layout that had my labels and my attributes, and then turning on the labels. So I want to see my custom label. This is this is not really something I wanted to cover in this demo, but you can set up custom labels that have attributes in them, and that's what these are. So here's the hub, um, uphill side slope, downhill side slope, comment, and let's display those labels. K, K. Uh, there's the culvert, and yeah, so I, I like this. This is something I can look at later in a background and I can turn it on and off because it's got nothing else in it. It's just the, the feature with the attributes. So that's that's something I can reuse. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, you can, for example, go to this one, which is um, hub number 22. Notice that it has a 600 millimeter culvert attached and you could, if you wanted to, go back to the survey module and put that in there. And then save it. So 
you can choose to move the the data from the GPS survey into the this is a dummy survey these azimuths and distances aren't they weren't recorded they were generated from the terrain um, these came from the survey and I could move other information I want in there now once I've got this thing created I can go back again to the final stage and create a new alignment from both the terrain and the traverse. And in this case, the traverse was exported by importing the GPS into the, into the terrain and then re-exporting as a TR2, TR1 file. And now I can start designing and finish my, my road design. That little file I created a second ago There it is. Or was it this one? I think it's this one. Let's look at the date here. Yeah, that one. Can now be displayed in the background so I can look at all those attributes. So even though I didn't copy them all, um, there they are. So I can I can look and see. By the way, as a final double check, um, you might want to look at your cross sections and see that the cross section that's uh, just lock scale for a second so we can read those things so that says that it's 40 percent up and 38 percent down i look over at my cross section here and sure enough i'm seeing 35 percent up and 44 percent down it's not perfect but it's close so yeah so it looks like things are right if you found that the um data from the ground survey was fundamental was significantly different from what you're seeing in your cross sections then you know you've got a, a, a misalignment you're not properly georeferenced okay um, let's go to the cut to the chase and open a finished design I got two finished designs here this is the one that was created from the um, the hand survey Oh, we've got lots of questions. I'm almost done. Um, really, everything after this has been covered by lots of other webinars. Um, but I wanted to point out the fundamental difference between a design with a P-line and a design without a P-line. The big difference is that the P-line here is not just a line on the screen. It's actually... Um, something that you can put in the data window and various other places. So labels, um, items you can display under your section window. Let's just look at the plan labels, for example. In this design, because I have a P-line, I have all these different labels that I can display that are related to the P-line itself. Um, culvert, comments at, uh, yeah, grades it on the P-line ground types from the P-line. Um, so, so that information is available to the location module. And in addition, there's the um, stuff that you can put in the data window. For example, staking offsets, um, horizontal offset from L-line to P-line. So right here, we've got a 10 meter offset. I moved it over quite a bit. And you can, you can see that there. Um, and you can see that that's flag at uh, hub number 25. So if I find the ribbon that says 25 on it in the field, I know I'm right here at this point. And there's my alignment. It's a little bit uphill. Um, you get the idea. So this concept of referencing data to the, to the surveyed P-line that has physical ribbons in the field is something you can do 
if you have a P line with your uh, location design. And once again, in the alignment tab of location setup, there's your P line. Now that's optional, it's not necessary. I could have skipped the whole process of creating the P line and just worked from that um, actual terrain feature. And in that case, I would have created a design sort of like this one. It's the same design, um, but there's no P line in the background. There is, however, a, ref a feature in the background, and I can see it. That's that feature that we created with the GPS coordinates and other information in the background. Again, I can see it there, but I can't refer to it in my data window. Um, I'd have to do a measurement, for example, to find out how far the offset is from that hub um, that I can see. Okay, that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Um, I've spent more time than, than usual, so let's stop there. Uh, if you wanted to at this point, you could generate, you know, your multi-plot output, you could save to land XML, you could save to events and maps, um, and we have covered those topics in the, in the past, so I'll leave it for now. And let's look at some of these questions. Excellent. Thank you, Dave. And yeah, thank you to everyone for sticking through with us into some overtime. Uh, as a reminder, you can use the Q&A section of the GoToWebinar panel to ask your questions. Uh, so Dave, uh, let's start here with our first one. Uh, was the data uh, that you've shown today collected with a regular Garmin handheld or an RTK? And I guess that's actually a question I did go and get, uh, we put what we believe to be the answer offline here, um, is we think it is somewhere between the two, a sub-meter external GPS. Uh, but we can confirm that uh, with the question asker 100% later. Uh, our next question, does, why does the GPS data not have any elevation? That's a good question. It may simply be Oh, you know what? It might have elevation in the attributes, uh, but shapefiles in general don't have elevation. Uh, I don't see an elevation in the attributes. Oh, wait a minute. Oh no, that's the elevation that I, that's, that's not an attribute. The attributes start here. Um, probably because the GPS wasn't good enough to get elevations that are accurate, and the surveyor knew that they were going to just drape it on the, on the LIDAR later. So they were more interested in, in the uh, XY coordinate. Excellent. Um, in terms of questions, lots coming in here. So yeah, hang with us. Lots of great questions to get to. Uh, next question, Dave. How do we get depth to rock attribute in terrain? OK, so the depth to rock attribute was recorded in the field and added to the GPS data. We want to see it here. All you need to do is change the custom label to include that. Um, I, I didn't cover the, the custom label um, setup, but here's labels, here's custom labels, and yeah, what the heck, why don't I just add it here? So I'm going to create a new custom label, and it's going to have, um, oh, this one's already got some stuff in it. Let's clear it. And let's add this attribute. This is the attribute that came from the shapefile. All the rest are our default road edge attributes or terrain attributes. And there's my depth to rock. Um, okay, so that will now appear as a label. You can add text to that. Um, I probably should have done it first. Yeah. Uh, okay, like so, okay. So now that label, um, as poorly formed as it is, will appear if I turn this thing on. Oh, and you can give it a name too. Uh, yeah, so if I display that and set up its position the way I want, that will be displayed as a label. 
So basically, you can put, and it's over, it's overwriting the other labels because uh, I didn't change its its position. Um, but basically, you can put any attribute in a label. Um, yeah. Any? What's the next question, Erin? Excellent. And you know, actually, this is uh, from one of our smart viewers. Uh, they did notice actually the GPS unit name was available in the attributes. So thank you, smart attendee, for that. Uh, it is the EOS Aero Submeter GPS. Oh, where do where do we see that? Uh, third from the bottom in your attributes. GPS unit arrow. Okay. Excellent. So our next question, kind of continuing along the GPS attribute thing, is where do the GPS attributes come from? Well, I didn't do the survey myself, but I'm guessing that there's a, a little handheld device that comes with the, um, the GPS unit. Uh, it may be a tablet, it may be a computer, it may be built into the GPS unit, and it allows you to type stuff in or check boxes. I mean, the, 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 the fastest way to do it would be if, you've, if you set up a, a form uh, and you actually fill the... Um, the form in the field as you go and so in some cases you might be able to just check check a checkbox um, without having to type anything but yeah it was done by the surveyor okay uh, next question uh, going back into the lidar side of things can the lidar read below the surface no lidar is strictly um, visible light it's not uh, doesn't go below the surface um, it just picks up anything that it hits, and of course, most of the time it hits trees in this situation. Uh, but a few of the uh, laser uh, strikes get all the way to the ground, and those returns are separated and made into ground returns. So the lighter doesn't give us any information about what's under the ground. All we know, and not even perfectly, uh, Sometimes foliage gets mistaken for ground, but usually you can tell when you see the surface. If it's too bumpy, um, that's that's why. Um, a question that I'm going to answer: uh, Can we get the recorded version of this webinar? And that answer is absolutely yes. We do post all of our webinars up onto our YouTube channel, and as a registrant of the webinar, uh, you should receive a link, uh, actually as an email follow-up, just thanking you for attending and giving you the link to watch it again. So uh, watch for that one. Okay, Dave, a couple more questions for you and then we'll let the let everyone go again. Thanks for staying into overtime. Uh, Dave, which method do you prefer, the GPS or traditional P-line? Well, seeing as I don't do either, I, um, you know, my opinion doesn't really matter. Uh, I think if I was out there, I would prefer the, the, the GPS method because it doesn't rely on um, human um, technique for getting good XY coordinates. All you need to do is find a spot with, with um, satellite visibility and sit for a minute and you'll get a good XY coordinate. Uh, the traditional survey requires that you take every shot very carefully and then you also have to add some uh, some GPS points. That said, in a situation where the canopy cover or the north facing slopes here in the northern hemisphere are steep, sometimes you just simply can't use GPS and you have to do um, traditional survey until you get to a point where you can pick up a tie point with your GPS. Okay, let's uh, let's tackle maybe two more questions. I'm just trying to filter through this long list. Um, I should say for anyone whose question that we don't get to today, uh, we will certainly follow up with that over email. Um, what uh, would the attribute need a certain data type to work with Softree? No, the attributes the any well, I think they're always either numeric or text, and um, yeah, I. I don't think you'd find an attribute that doesn't work with Softree. So that's that's my qualified answer. Excellent. Well, I mean, perhaps a challenge to those smart users out there to try and uh, yeah, 
find find things that don't work. Uh, lastly, and this is another one for me, kind of more from the logistical standpoint, uh, will registrants automatically get an e-certificate via email? Uh, we've changed our format a little bit in terms of how certificates are generated. Uh, previously, they were generated for anyone who just simply showed up, even if it was for a minute within the webinar. Uh, we feel that's kind of not fair. So we are, yeah, looking to make sure uh, folks are um, attending the webinar and uh, for those who actually do and stay for the majority of it, uh, they absolutely can get a certificate. Uh, we'll take a look at your registration info. If you requested one, you will have one generated and sent to you over email and that should be within the next 24 hours. So lastly, thank you all again. Uh, we've certainly gone into overtime. Uh, we appreciate you all joining us here today. Look forward to seeing you at upcoming webinars, including the one on uh, rural roads and sites and culverts coming up uh, in a couple weeks and following that, uh, the one with uh, laser tech on February 11th. Thank you all for joining and have an awesome day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching another Softree webinar. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel below or tell us that you like the video. Thanks for watching.